you know, men are really anxious and nervous about their PSA tests, you know. The higher the number, well, the more of a problem there is. And holy cow, I may die. Today, we're going to talk about PSA doubling time and what that means to you. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention and my goal to deliver to you practical information so that you can improve your urological health and live better with age. Today's conversation is going to be more on, you know, a little bit of a deeper dive, right? On, on PSA, that biomarker that is way more nerve wracking than high cholesterol, right? Way more. If you have a triglycerides of 300, you're not as nervous as when there's a PSA that's really high, right? And you've heard me say this before, of course. What does PSA stand for? Patient stimulated anxiety. <laughs> that's patient stimulated anxiety. So we want to take a deeper dive because I just want you to, as I, you know, finish my book called the PSA book and how to not stress so much over it. That is the goal. The goal is for to look at this number objectively and not to make it more than what it is, right? Stress a little less. So the deeper dive back in episode six of, of the podcast, I did a little overview and I, I would suggest for you to check that out on overview on PSA, what it is and how do we use it and how it's used in healthcare. Today, I want to talk a little bit more specifically on the different subtypes and components of PSA that you've seen and that people talk about that you have no idea what it means. And I think you should know what it means so that you can be proactive in your own healthcare, right? Because that, that's the goal. The goal is for you to drive your own ship, for you to be the captain of your ship and to have better conversations with your urologist and your general practitioner about your own health. So you need some basic fundamental knowledge so that you can have these type of improved conversations with your healthcare practitioners. As it relates to PSA, you and I both know that there are subtypes. When you look at a lab report, you see free PSA and free percentage PSA. When you look at your urologist's notes, sometimes there's information on PSA density, and you heard the terminology of PSA doubling time. In fact, what triggered me talking about this podcast today is that I recently wrote a report to uh, my audience, the drgeo.com. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, it's, it's good stuff. Drgeo.com. I wrote about the impact. This is a study that just came out showing that essentially that a plant-based diet is protective against prostate cancer, right? That's the, that's the basic gist. And when you break that study down a little bit more and what they, they it's highlighted one study, one specific study, and they showed that those that had a healthier lifestyle and plant-based diet and all these other things had a, a, after prostate cancer treatment, had a longer PSA doubling time. So immediately emails came in and I wrote it as a good thing. You know, it's a good thing. So lifestyle helps you with, with a longer doubling time. And the emails came in and they were questioning, well, I, I thought doubling time is not a good thing with PSA. Why are you saying it as a good thing? So here we are. We're going to talk about that. I'm not going to do an overview on PSA because you can check that out on episode six. But I will say this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the PSA biomarker to tell us if we have something really sinister in our prostate, if we have uh, some uh, malignant cells, prostate cancer in our prostate. So what we know is the following. What we know is that total PSA, which is what you're doctor orders, when you go for a blood test, they're ordering total PSA. Sometimes you don't even see free or free percentage PSA. It's not automatic. So your doctor has to check those boxes. 
not only for total PSA when he orders blood work, but also for free PSA and free percentage PSA. What he's ordering for normally is total PSA. And that number is used as a screening tool for prostate cancer. So I know the deal. Well, Dr. Gio, you know, everybody says, I read on the internet, PSA is not a good screening tool for prostate cancer. Read about that and hear about that on episode six of the Dr. Gio podcast. What I would say is this, you want to look at the totality of the information and use PSA as one indicator, not the end all be all. And within that, you have other subtypes like free PSA and free percentage PSA. All right. So here we go. When you look at that blood test, you're looking at total PSA, then there's free PSA, and then then there's free percentage PSA, which is ultimately what we look at to differentiate between prostate cancer and just an enlarged prostate. That's all that does. And typically you want to get the free PSA percentage is more useful when the total PSA is between four and 10. So when you look at your blood test as a range, it's at zero to four. Go back to episode six. The zero to four range is ridiculous. So don't even worry about that. It's age dependent and things like that. But if the PSA is between four to 10, then it might be valuable to have a free percentage PSA along with that to help you differentiate. Do I have an enlarged prostate and that's why my PSA is high? Or is it prostate cancer? The only reason why there's a, to- there's a total and free is because PSA in the blood is bound to other proteins. The more bound this PSA molecule is to other proteins, the higher the likelihood of there being prostate cancer. The more free, the more free this PSA is that is not bound to these proteins, the lesser the likelihood of there being prostate cancer. And if that percentage free PSA is high, then it's probably related to an enlarged prostate, not prostate cancer. What we want to do is differentiate between the two. Actually, let me take that a step further. What we're really trying to differentiate and what we're really trying to find out is the following. Do I have prostate cancer that can potentially kill me. Just today, I got a biopsy report from an amazing patient who now 72, third biopsy, MRI guided, uh, the real, a good biopsy done, he, nervous. He got a Gleason 6 prostate cancer, right? Which that's another episode. We, talk, we talked about Gleason 6 in one of uh, the podcasts. Can't remember that episode, but we'll, we'll put it on the show notes. Gleason 6 prostate cancer is no problem. It's actually a good thing because now you're, you, you can if there, you can reevaluate your life and live your best life moving forward because you got this little scare. And a scare is good for men to do the stuff, right? Uh, eat healthier, exercise, take the right supplements, things like that. We want to know not only if one has prostate cancer, because you can have low risk prostate cancer and never bothers you, but I want to know if there's aggressive prostate cancer that's developing that we can treat it early. That's what we all want to know. So free PSA percentage helps you only to differentiate between enlarged prostate, BPH, and prostate cancer. Not the aggressive type, not the low risk. So it's a good, it's better than total PSA, free PSA percentage, but it's still not what I really want to know, which is, do I have prostate cancer that will eventually kill me? And if I take care of it now, it will save my life. That's it. So then when you look at free PSA percentage, it gives you certain numbers. The lower that free PSA percentage is from 25%, the higher the likelihood of there being prostate cancer there. So 25% is roughly the cutoff. And I say roughly because I think 20%, some people think 20% is the cutoff, roughly 20%, 25% is the cutoff. So when you look at your blood work and it says PSA of, I don't know, six, 6.2, free percentage PSA, 25 or 30 or 40, then the likelihood of there being a high PSA only from an enlarged prostate is significant and low likelihood there of being prostate cancer. In that same situation where their total PSA is 6.2, but the free PSA is, let's just say 10%, there's some likelihood there of being prostate cancer. Is it aggressive? Is it a Gleason 6? We don't know. It doesn't tell you that. And there's other things to look for to determine if that free percentage of 10 is a Gleason 6 or higher. Remember, Gleason scores are how you stage prostate cancer, right? So that is the deal with free PSA and total PSA. The next thing is on 
doubling time, PSA doubling time. Dr. Gio, I thought PSA doubling time is a problem. Why did you say it's a good thing? All right, here's what we mean by that. The definition of PSA doubling time is how long it takes for PSA to double in, in, in value, in number. As an example, it's important before a diagnosis of prostate cancer, but even more after a diagnosis of prostate cancer and after treatment for prostate cancer, because then that's used for to uh, determine if the patient is um, having some uh, recurrence of prostate cancer, if it came back. PSA doubling time. Let's just say in a situation before a diagnosis. PSA doubling time, let's just say, again, let's keep the number simple, is a two. Today, you come in, you come to my office today. Hey, 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 John, nice to meet you. You know, your PSA is two. Let's just wait another six months and get another PSA. Okay, John? All right. I don't think there's anything happening, but you know, let's just see. You come six months from now and now your PSA is a four. So the amount of time that your PSA took to double was six months. The longer the doubling time, the better. So in that same situation, hey, John, nice to meet you. Uh, to PSA today is two. Let's take another PSA in six months, just to see that PSA is 2.1 in six months. Let's just say I see you five years from now, eventually. And now that PSA is four, unlike the first scenario where that PSA doubling time, uh, doubling time was six months, that second scenario, now the PSA doubling time is five years. So there's less of a likelihood of there being prostate cancer or PSA rising from prostate cancer with a doubling time of, of PSA of five years versus six months. So the longer the doubling time, the better. So a longer doubling time is a good thing. So in this study showing that plant-based diet increased the doubling time of patients on the diet versus those that were not on a diet, which had a shorter doubling time of PSA, they did better. And that's what that's about, is literally how long does it take for PSA to double? Longer is better. The other thing that we look at that I think it's important is PSA density. PSA density. Once again, we're simply trying to determine, is it an enlarged prostate or is it prostate cancer? PSA density cannot really tell you if, if, if it's aggressive prostate cancer or not. It just kind of differentiates between malignant and benign prostate. So PSA density, what's that about? It's a calculation. You calculate the size of the prostate over the PSA value let's just say PSA of six, size of the prostate over PSA value, and then you're going to get a number. That number, the cutoff for PSA density is about 0.15. So the higher the number above 0.15, the higher the likelihood, again, likelihood of there being prostate cancer there. We don't know if it's aggressive or not. The lower that number from the cutoff of 0.15 the less likely is there to be prostate cancer. Maybe you have a high PSA from an enlarged prostate because there's a lot of benign reasons why you get an enlarged prostate, which is um, there's an article on drgeo.com on why, why is this pesky prostate giving me so much trouble and why does this patient-stimulated anxiety number continues to be so high? Well, there's a lot of benign reasons, right? So look into that. PSA density, how do you get the size of the prostate? You get the size of the prostate from an ultrasound or even better from a pelvic MRI. The size coming from a pelvic MRI is way better than a ultrasound that your urologist has in his office. It's more accurate to get an MRI, a pelvic MRI that gives you that number, size of your prostate, from an MRI than an ultrasound. And there again, all we're doing is putting this information together. So PSA, total PSA, free PSA, PSA density, and putting the picture together to see if you even need a biopsy. And if you do to trying to figure out, do you need treatment from prostate cancer? Or do you even have prostate cancer? Probably from benign reasons, could be. Lastly, the other thing we look at is PSA velocity. PSA velocity, how PSA increases within a year's time. So the cutoff roughly for PSA velocity is about 0.5. So in other words, let's keep the number simple. You come to my office, Tom, Tom, how you doing? PSA today, Tom, is two. We're going to check your PSA in a year to see what it is, okay, as well, and kind of follow it closely. And, and you're, I don't know, a 63-year-old man. You come a year from now, and that PSA is... 
three. Okay, so it went from a two to a three in one year. So that's, uh, it went up by a point. Could be for benign reasons, but anything above 0.5, an increase above 0.5, you kind of want to start looking into it. And it's only one piece of the puzzle. You don't take any one thing for face value and make a decision on one number. You look at everything. So roughly a normal situation, and I say that in, in air quotes, normal, because there's a lot of abnormalities with PSA still and how we use it as a biomarker for prostate cancer and a screening tool for it. A PSA shouldn't rise more than 0.5 points within a year's time, roughly. And that's PSA velocity. What's the change PSA within a year's time? So you look at doubling time, you look at free percentage PSA, uh, you look at PSA velocity, PSA density, and all these subtypes, forms of PSA, and the use of PSA value can be helpful for us to determine, you know what, you need a biopsy, or you know what, uh, based on all this information, you don't, or with this information, you know what, let's get a pelvic MRI to see if, if you know, and we can, and we could do all sorts of other tests before you go and get your, no one, no one ever, no one ever wakes up in the morning and says to himself, oh man, I can't, boy, I can't wait to get that prostate biopsy today. There's nothing more that I need than a rod up my butt with a needle going through my rectum to get pieces of tissue of my prostate. I can't wait. No one. So there's a lot of things we can do before that even happens. Looking at PSA in a little more, in a, uh, in a better way, looking at these subtypes helps. You need to be proactive in that conversation. You need to be part of that conversation and ask better questions. Dr. Smith, can you tell me my PSA density? Can we, should we look at that before we biopsy? That sounds reasonable to me. What's my PSA velocity here? I know it was this, you know, this was a year ago. What was that? What's the doubling time? Percentage. Can you make sure you check the box for free uh, percentage PSA? Let's look at it all before determining what the next steps are. I really appreciate you tuning in to this podcast and to all the episodes that you might've heard. Let me know how I can do better. I really want to know how I can do better. What is it that you want to learn about from the world of urology and men's health? I have a lot of experience. If not, if I don't know it, I know where to go to find out accurate uh, information. Let me know. Uh, post in any of the platforms, YouTube, drgeo.com. Send me an email. Let me know how it can help. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Dr. Geo signing off. I'll talk to you next time.